Hi, good evening. Thank you for coming out tonight. And uh, thank you to the World Science Festival for hosting this program. And thank you to our other participants who are now going to be joining me on stage, and then I will introduce them. Starting from at the far left, uh, Rachel Rosen uh, is a, an assistant professor of theoretical physics at Columbia University. Her research focuses on gravity, quantum field theory, and the intersection of the two. Thank you, Rachel, for joining us. Jabo Marca is the leader of the Columbia Experimental Gravity Group in LIGO and a professor of physics at Columbia University. Maria Sparapoulou is a physics professor at Caltech. She's been researching elementary particles and their interactions at Fermilab's Tevatron and CERN's Large Hadron Collider. David Gross is the Chancellor's Chair Professor of Theoretical Physics at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He was awarded the 2004 Nobel Prize in Physics for his discovery of asymptotic freedom, which led to the formulation of quantum chromodynamics. And Pedro Ferreira is a Professor of Astrophysics at the University of Oxford. His most recent book, The Perfect Theory, is published in, over, in more than 20 countries. <laughs> So I'd like to open tonight, what we're going to do, you know, there's been a lot of talk about gravitational waves this week, uh, and a lot of it has been technical, and there's going to be another talk after this in the Skirball Center. Uh, and a lot of it is technical and hard science, and I thought that maybe tonight here in this panel we could have um, a, little, a little looser interpretation, maybe more philosophical, metaphysical, maybe not strictly scientific, more speculative perhaps. Uh, so I'm going to open up with a question that I actually asked. Kip Thorne a few weeks ago on the phone. Uh, Kip was one of the founders of LIGO and, uh, and one of the recipients of the Kavli Prize earlier uh, in the week at the festival. Uh, so I'm going to ask this question to the panel, and they can answer it in, or not answer it in any way <laughs> they prefer. And, uh, and then after you're done, I'll tell you what Kip said. So my question is, what is gravity? Stunned silence. <laughs> <laughs> Any order? No, just jump in, please. I wish we really knew. So, I mean, we can certainly, it's easy enough to describe properties of gravity. It's easy enough to describe theories of gravity. We've had two marvelous theories. But what is, um, for somebody like me, raises it, the question marks and not the answers that we already know. Uh, so, in a deep sense, we don't think we know the answer to that because of some of the things we'll be probably discussing later. But in a practical sense, if I want to send a moon, uh, no, sorry, if I want to send a rocket, rocket to, to the moon, moon. <laughs> uh, we know precisely what is right. gravity. Or, by the way, if I want to calculate uh, the ripples, the waves that might move the arms of LIGO by a fraction of the size of the proton, I can also calculate that. Right. So we have a pretty good practical understanding of gravity. But conceptually, I don't know. Right. Um, that's one of the ideas I wanted to introduce to the audience, is that this thing that we take for granted, that we live with, that we don't even think about, except when it's in headlines, uh, is something that we don't really know what it is. Uh, and Kip Thorne's answer was, it's a meaningless question. But, <laughs> <laughs> but probably the answer to the, the, the you would uh, get the same uh, answer to uh, that question, like as David's answer, if you ask, what is dark matter? Right. So we know the properties of dark matter, and it has to do with gravity, but we don't know what dark matter is. Yeah. And the other part of uh, this discussion, even it's even worse, actually, yes. Yeah. You ask, what is dark energy? And again, it has to do with gravity, but you right. can't say what it is. Right. So I don't think it's a meaningless question, but it's a question uh, t to which the answer we don't have today in a way that we have answers to the question, what is the Higgs boson or what is the electroweak symmetry or what is the standard model? We don't have the same kind of answer to what is gravity. Right. Yeah. right. And if you, if you wish, um, from an experimental viewpoint, we have we have models and theories of gravity 
successively better and better. Um, and uh, they describe nature very well. Matter of fact, so well that we don't find a way out of it. Mm -hmm. We just know or suspect it must be wrong because it's not a quantum theory. Mm -hmm. So that's why Rachel is here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's, take a, let's begin with a historical perspective. I'll ask Pedro to begin the discussion. Um, as, I, as, I, as everybody has said, we don't really know what gravity is. And for most of the history of civilization, gravity as, as a concept wasn't really thought of. It wasn't until uh, Newton came along that people started to use the word gravitation and to think about, well, what, what is this thing and what are its properties? And then I'll ask Pedro to take us briefly from Newton to, and especially Einstein as the author of the book, um, the, the Perfect Theory, you dealt a lot with. Einstein. Well, I can give you a whistle um, stop tour through it. And, and I actually can relate it to something that David said. He said two things. He said, we, we can send rockets to the moon and we can calculate ripples in space time. We can send ro rockets to the moon basically because, uh, you know, 300 years ago, a guy called Newton f uh, figured out that he could explain why apples fall to the surface of the earth or why planets go around <coughs> the sun in terms of a very simple equation, a very simple law. And it's this um, law of universal attraction, which is proportional to the mass of objects and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. In other words, the further away things are, the weaker the force is. And it works beautifully. And it's, a fanta it's fantastic. You can, calculate, you can calculate how you send rockets to the moon very well. Um, the interesting thing about this is it, it has a, a bizarre property in that it it's, um, it's, it's has an action at a distance. In other words, it, it happens instantaneously. There's no there's no speed in this. There's no information there, there's no information of how fo how fast this um, this force propagates between objects. And by the turn of the beginning of the 20th century, this was a problem because Einstein had figured out how to marry um, the laws of mechanics, the laws of how things move with the laws of light. And I'm not going to go into this, but uh, one of the things that came out of this is that there was a, a cosmic speed limit. There was Things couldn't propagate faster than a certain speed. So there was this inconsistency between this law of gravity that works remarkably well and understanding of physics at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, over seven years, he tried to figure out how to bring things together, and he came up with his... Uh, his theory of gravity. It, 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 um, at some point, he was completely stuck. He didn't know how to do it. He, he went to his friend and said, this is driving me nuts. I just don't know how to do it. His friend gave him a paper and a textbook on Riemannian geometry, geometry. And uh, Einstein had to learn this stuff. And he figured out that his theory, the way to, to couch his theory, to, uh, the way to explain his theory, and so an answer to what is gravity is the following. If you put stuff in space-time, it'll s deform space-time. If you now throw stuff through space-time, the stuff that you throw through space-time will feel the deformations of space-time and will curve and bend as if it was feeling a force coming from the thing that you put in there initially. So that's a kind of a simple summary of Einstein's theory of gravity, of general relativity. Um, so that was, you know, that's a, that's a three-minute summary of the history of uh, general relativity and gravity. <laughs> but, but within 10 years after uh, Einstein's creation of uh, general relativity, it ran into a problem with quantum mechanics. And I was going to ask David to address that. Before I do, let me say another point about gravity, <laughs> which is, so, you know, I often give talks about uh, the big questions in physics and the what we understand about the fundamental laws of nature. And, and, uh, and I explain to people like you that Gravity is central because, in a sense, most of the time, it's the only force any of you ever feel. Now, actually, it's the w in ordinary energy scales, or even within the atom, it's by far the weakest possible imaginary f imaginable force and totally negligible. And we particle physicists who do experiments at LHC, for example, like Maria, or theorists who work on the structure of matter, atoms, molecules, ignored gravity completely for years and years because it's so weak. Forty orders of magnitude. That's a million, 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 uh, that was about another million times weaker than the force of electricity inside the atom. But it's the only force you ever feel. And people find that sort of jarring. Now, why, why do you feel it? if it's the weakest possible force in nature. 
And the reason is because, for two reasons. One is that there's no anti-gravity. There's no way of shielding it. Two is it's universal. Newton called his theory the universal theory of gravity because it acts on everything that possesses mass or energy. And so everything feels it. And the reason you feel gravity is that when you get up in the morning, <sighs> the whole earth is pulling you down. Every atom on the earth is acting on you. Mm -hmm. And it's, there's no, nothing Just stop it. stopping it. There's no anti-gravity. That's not true of all the other forces. Electricity, there's positive charge. There's negative charge. They attract, but they also create, when they come together, a neutral object that has no charge. Atoms, unless you ionize them, are neutral. That's why you don't feel the infinitely stronger force of electricity and magnetism. And then there's the force inside the proton and the nucleus that holds the quarks together, which is much, much stronger than electricity. And yet you've never felt it. That's because protons are neutral. They too have a charge, we call color charge, which is neutralized by these quarks coming together and forming a neutral object. So the only forces that remain are sort of weak molecular forces between neutral atoms and weak, not that weak, uh, nuclear forces between protons and neutrons. But by and large it's shielded. Gravity is universal. And as was just explained. Gravity is universal because it is, in effect, has to do with the dynamics of space and time. And space and time are our most universal basic concepts of physical reality. We all construct this picture of space and time. And Einstein tells us that space and time is dynamical, energy and mass curve it, and that's what gives rise to what we used to call the gravitational force. So it has a certain special role in science which differentiates it from the other much, much stronger forces. Universality, no anti-gravity, nothing can shield it. But when you extrapolate what we understand about gravity from Newton and or Einstein to very high energies and very small distances, quantum mechanics come, comes into play just as it did with the much, much stronger forces inside the atom and the nucleus. Because it's so weak, we can't imagine observing directly those quantum effects. Theorists, however, can imagine doing experiments at very high energies. And then we run into all sorts of problems. And they have to do, really, with the fact that gravity is a theory of dynamical space-time. And in quantum mechanics, everything is fluctuating. You try to observe anything, you set it in motion. And therefore, we suspect that in gravity as well, if you do observations at very short distances where the gravitational force becomes strong, you would see fluctuating space and time. Space just wouldn't be something that exists there. It's dynamical and quantum mechanically fluctuating like mad in ways which we can't yet control. So that's a conceptual problem we face. And uh, there are many other conceptual problems we, we might get to which motivates theorists, by and large, to try to marry quantum mechanics and gravity. We are moving along that path with some recent successes but the answer is far from clear, and the speculations, which we might get to later, are mind-boggling. Yes, I want to get to the speculations later. But when you say that space is fluctuating, what do you, what do you mean by that? Every space, in Einstein's theory, is a dynamical entity. Uh, you know, the naive picture that infants create of space that's when you learned about space, by the way. That's how you <laughs> learned how to get from crawl across the room. You did it somehow, I don't know. It's a and major gravity. achievement. That's, you also learned about gravity. Well, you learned about something that was holding you to the floor. But, but more, I think much more important, you constructed a model of, of events taking place in space and in time. Not a trivial task, because nobody knows how to teach a computer to construct a model of space and time. But 
uh, then we learned that, you know, it's really space-time. And then we learned, both from Einstein, that it's not just there, it's not just a coordinate system, it's, just, it's not just a rigid, and it's not, it's dynamical. It, it can be curved. If I, if I put a sun into this room, the, the sun into this room, it would slightly curve space. It would no longer be Euclidean flat. It would be curved like the surface of the Earth is curved. And, and that you can explain the motion of particles in the vicinity of the sun by saying they're moving in straight lines except in this curved space. So it looks like they deviate. And can we but say anything dynamical in quantum mechanics is fluctuating. You know, that's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You can't be at rest at a given place because if you try to observe that, you have to interact with that system and you set it in motion. Well, space itself is dynamical and when you try to observe the structure of space, what is space really? Yeah. You set it in motion. And that's such an incredibly small effect in this room that we don't worry about it. We can simply say space is fixed. We, yeah. you know. But if you try to observe space, the structure of space, at very short distances, according to Einstein's theory and the rules of quantum mechanics, the fluctuations of space itself would be so immense and uncontrollable that we suspect that something goes wrong with our model of space and time, which largely dates back to the first few months of our lives. Maria, yeah, I, w I just wanted to say that this alludes to the fact that in in, in the origins of space-time um, are being uh, considered now to be quantum mechanical. Mm -hmm. So quantum mechanics is the place where space-time emerges. It's not just classical. Uh, uh, Einstein's theory of relativity is a classical theory, but the underpinning of space-time as a dynamical system, which is not just a stage where we move on a stage, but it actually emerges is could is quantum mechanical, and yeah. that's where the fluctuation then is, uh, tiny fluctuations can be thought of. Yeah. Um, so it's like the fluctuations were at the beginning and then they smoothed out from our perspective. Uh, they look smooth because you observe them at large, at large scale. scale. Yeah. Just like, uh, you know, you look smooth, but I know you're mostly vacuum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so says my wife. No. <laughs> So, but also we can say one, one thing that, that um, uh, kind of the, a question that emerges from this is that if you are considering the mass um, in general theory of relativity as the source of the curvature of, of space-time and therefore gravity exists, and then we learn that elementary particles get their mass through a quantum theory, quantum field theory pheno phenomenon, the, the phenomenon of the Higgs mechanism. So the, the question that people ask a, a lot of times is how does the Higgs who endows mass to the particles connect it to gravity? And these are questions that we don't have answers to. Mm -hmm. but, but obviously we, tr we start seeing that somehow all of this is connected and the, 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 the conundrum of gravity ha has to come to some sort of an understanding, I think, sooner than later, yeah. probably sooner. Mm -hmm. Now, for all that we're talking about general relativity and we're all treating it uh, in this kind of common way, there was a period, which I'll ask Pedro to expand on a little bit, uh, when general relativity fell into, I don't know if it was disfavor or just invisibility or how, how you would want to characterize it. Well, so, so Einstein comes up with this theory and for the next 15 years, it's, it's a, a lot of people are doing calculations and coming up with wonderful things. They solve for what happens if you put an object in space-time. They figure out what happens to the whole universe. It's what a, a graduate student of mine said. It's you, you, they were picking the low-hanging fruit. You, when you come up with a theory in the initial, you know, the initial few years, there's all this beautiful stuff you can calculate quite easily. And then its younger sister, quantum mechanics, came on the scene and stole the, sh the, stole the thunder. Um, quantum mechanics is great because with general relativity applies to the very large, quantum mechanics applies to the very small, it applies to stuff you can do in the lab, it's practical, people can do calculations, people can go and do measurements, it's so much more interesting for physicists. Um, and not only that, it's useful, you know, people built the atom bomb. 
Um, uh, and this meant that uh, a lot of the a lot of the intellectual uh, activity went into quantum mechanics was sucked away from general relativity. Uh, one of the problems with general relativity was there were a few early measurements that tested it, and then there was nothing else. You know, there was really nothing that could be measured. Uh, there was there was um there was a meeting in 1957 uh, organized by by a, a guy who worked on quantum gravity, Bryce DeWitt, and where he brought the relativists together to say, what are we going to do? You know, what are, what are we, what, what's the future of general relativity? And Feynman went to this meeting, and um, I've got a quote. He, he, he got, went to this meeting, and he, he was very interested. He'd, he'd, done, he'd done quantum electrodynamics. He was looking for one of the next things to do. And he summarized, and he said, there exists one serious difficulty, and that is the lack of experiments. Furthermore, we're not going to get any experiments, so we have to take the viewpoint of how to deal with the problems where no experiments are available. Um, he said, well, the best viewpoint is to pretend that there are experiments and calculate. In this field, we are not pushed by experiments, but pulled by imagination. Mm -hmm. And this really characterized general relativity for, for 30 years um, until the early 1960s. It still does. I mean, it hasn't changed. Mm. LIGO. You, no, LIGO uses general relativity, uses uh, gravitational waves, will use gravitational waves to oh, learn about astro <laughs> <laughs> to, the, to learn about um, compact objects in the universe and even black holes. But the kinds of things that Bryce DeWitt was talking about was trying to understand quantum gravity. And we're in the same situation. And it's because, as I said, gravitation, gravity is such a weak force. Its effects at... So, the highest energy microscope we have that probes short distances is the one that Maria works at at the LHC. And it can probe down to nano, nanometers, a billionth of a billionth of a meter, or even farther by now, and a uh, hundred <laughs> times farther. And they at the LHC never talk about gravity. There's some wild speculations that they might see extra dimensions and maybe gravity effects, but those are pretty wild. They don't, they don't have to worry about it. Or, the other way around, uh, they're not lucky enough to be able to explore it. It's still, experimentally, the problems that DeWitt was talking about, how to formulate a consistent quantum mechanical theory of gravity, are unimaginably beyond experimental, direct study. Still, and it's still the case, that the biggest advances we make in the field of trying to understand how to reconcile quantum mechanics and general relativity uh, are done by uh, performing thought exper experiments, much as Einstein did in formulating the theory, get Duncan experiments. Shabi, you were going to say something? Yes, so, so in my view, um, it was quite natural that, that the observation lagged behind in GR, general relativity, because humanity was not ready. We were not ready technologically and uh, for even gravitational waves. We had to wait 100 years from the idea of, of gravitational wave until we could observe. It's not because we were stupid. We had to wait because we didn't have the right technology. We had to invent it. And 2016, when we were ready with the technology. I mean, it's not a new idea. In the 1950s, people already had an idea of, say, a laser interferometer. Uh, it was not called laser interferometer because laser was not invented yet, <laughs> but they, 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 they actually formulated the, the fact that you can use light to test gravitational waves. But, you know, 1950s and 2016, it's a long time, yeah? You know, a couple of lifespans because we didn't have the technology. And, and I think, I think uh, as an experimentalist, I have to express that there will be tests uh, of general relativity, quantum gravity, but maybe we have to get ready. Maybe, maybe technology will not be ready in my lifetime. Maybe, maybe it will be the job of the um, young people sitting in this audience. Yeah? So I would like to encourage you to learn about gravity. <laughs> So what changed in the, in the 60s or after the, the 1958 meeting? What, was it just technology or was it theory working with technology? What, that, well, that general this meeting in Chapel back. Hill, this famous meeting that uh, Ben was talking about, uh, so what happened was there was a transfer of theoretical technology from quantum field theory, which had the first quantum electrodynamics and 
into this classical field. So from a field that was dominated by people following Einstein and doing classical calculations, calculations. you had people who were knew about relativistic quantum field theory, which was a very difficult subject in its own, but enormously advanced in the end of the 20th century. That's the basis of our standard theory of particle physics. Even more, and this is really, I think, the crux of the matter, is that we... So, you know, I was a particle theorist. I took a great course on general relativity from Steven Weinberg when I was a graduate student. That was wonderful. But I, that was just for cultural reasons. Mm. It had no influence on the work I was trying to do to understand the strong force. <laughs> However, in the course of constructing this incredibly successful standard model of particle physics, we discovered that the, or, that the underlying conceptual structure of the standard model of particles is, in a deep sense, very similar to general relativity. Mm. There is a unity of nature mm. that was discovered, and it didn't take long, therefore, for people doing particle physics, already in the middle 70s, to extrapolate their theories to the regime where gravity becomes equally important, mm. and to discover that they all seem to merge at the same place. And furthermore, that new theories, like string theory, come unified them. And to some extent, that effort to unify the other forces together with gravity does begin to resolve some of the paradoxes that, that we had. But so nature taught us something coming from understanding electromagnetism and the nuclear forces about gravity. And it, it suggests what has been for the last 30 years the the most successful attempt to try to reconcile the two. But but I, I I mean but that is one strand of the development of general relativity. I mean I think the thing that happened post uh, in the early 60s is there was this field that was created because of all these people who worked during the war on radar which is um radio astronomy. They brought these techniques they looked up at the sky and they discovered that the universe was teeming with these objects, which were very powerful radio sources, um, mm. incredibly powerful. Um, and if you worked out how much energy they had and, you know, early 60s people measured how far away they are, they realized that these mm. objects were immense. And these objects, to understand these objects, you had to go back to general relativity. These were very massive objects where space-time would be very curved and you had to go back to general relativity. So. That was one of one of the things that um, mm -hmm. kicked off, and so I think general relativity really came back. It's it, Kip Thorne has called it the golden age of general relativity because of what's been called relativistic astrophysics. Mm -hmm. Is this this right. merger of astronomers and and um, and relativists in trying to understand these objects? Yeah, and the advent of black hole physics is the lab exactly. for the people. Who I mean, it's, it's studying. It's really them. remarkable. I mean, if if you you read the history, you know, so black holes become a reality in the 1960s. Yet in the early 1970s, you know, they're established. But if you would talk to astronomers, they it was still you know it was you were pushing it. Black holes weren't really that real. Nowadays, if you talk to my colleagues in my, I, I mean, I'm a theorist in an astrophysics department. Um, you talk to them, there's no doubt that there are black holes. There are black holes everywhere. There is a black hole at the center of every galaxy. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it drives a lot of the big research programs in astrophysics. For example, in the next couple of years, an, a, a telescope called the Event Horizon Telescope is going to try and look at the black hole at the center of our galaxy. So, uh, so I would say that it's, it's true what David is saying about the evolution of, of, um, uh, of quantum gravity, but it, the way that general relativity then contaminated astronomy oh, is, 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 you know, it's a huge... It's a separate thing. Yeah. Uh, quantum effects are, again, totally negligible. I irrelevant, yeah. But uh, there's other, one other thing you, you didn't stress, which is, was equally important in that whole era, starting with Einstein immediately, which was physical cosmology. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So in 19... 15, 100 years ago when the theory was formed, people still thought you know, the Milky Way was the universe and, and there weren't even other galaxies and actually knew nothing about the universe except there were all these points of light up there. They, knew, they didn't know about the composition of stars, what makes them shine, anything. And 100 years later, 
we have a, this unbelievable history of the universe in great detail. All of that, especially the large-scale cosmology part, required general relativity, which Einstein was the first to construct the model of. Right. And he only did so initially, you know. It's very interesting. I, it was a marvelous quote recently from Einstein in which he writes to his friend Ehrenfest describing his first attempt to construct a cosmological model of the universe. And that was be, and and I, I understood finally what, what was motivating him. He wrote down these equations, describes gravity, he calculated the perihelion of Mercury, he predicted the deflection of light, and then he said, okay, I have these equations, they describe the dynamics of space and time, what is the universe? It's space-time. I should be able to construct a model of the universe. But he clearly was scared that it wouldn't work. Because mm -hmm. what an extrapolation. It's even bigger than Newton to go from describing gravity, pl motion of planets, to having a theory of the universe. So he constructed a pretty silly model, which was unstable and introduced the, the cosmological constant and so on. And he wrote there and first, well, I feel so relieved. And I understand why he felt relieved, I think, because he was worried that if he took this theory, constructed to explain the motion of planets and so on, consistent with the relativity principle, and then applied it to the universe, it would be totally inconsistent. You take a theory, you construct for a limited set of phenomena, then you extrapolate it, because you must extrapolate, and it, and it fails. But it didn't totally fail for at least a few months. I mean, it was sensible. And he, he felt so relieved that his equations were logically consistent when extrapolated to the ultimate domain. Well, partly what defeated him, I, I guess, <clears throat> in, in terms of predicting the expansion of the universe is that he was only, that his universe was one galaxy big. And that galaxy is not. It was also, a, you know, Einstein was a genius, but he, like all of us, suffer from prejudices or right. hidden assumptions. And if you go out at night and look at the sky, it's beautiful. You go out the next night, it hasn't changed. So obviously you assume that it never changes. Mm -hmm. It's eternal. Well, there's motion because we're going around the sun and so on. But yeah, it's, it's, it's static. So his goal was to construct a universe that never changed. Mm -hmm. A static universe with no beginning, no end, just permanent. And, uh, and boy, that was a big mistake because he otherwise could have predicted the Hubble expansion of the universe, which would have, in my mind, have been the greatest prediction ever made. Mm -hmm but he didn't make it. Well, to, re to rewind from the expansion of the universe, you go back and you go back to the uh, initial point, whatever you want to call it, and that was the, uh, the cosmic microwave background, the afterglow of that event uh, was discovered in the 60s, and that also helped revive the ideas of general relativity, because you would need that to begin to explain um, the conditions that are that, that dense and the expansion of the universe. So that, that opens up, what was the phrase you, you used? Uh, Which one? Uh, the good one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, um, the golden age? The, yeah, the gold, thank you, the, right. the golden age. That, um, so that was part of the golden age. That, mm. uh, it's, it's, can I just say something? Yeah, it's interesting, I, I didn't mention cosmology. What I do is cosmology, so it's interesting that I ignored. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, please. Yeah. Come so yeah. so one one note which is which is less less about the theoretical development but more about the science sociological development. Yeah, I mean gravity up until quite recently was kind of a boutique boutique science. Yeah, relatively few people were interested. I mean even know that that gravitation waves are on the front page of every newspaper. Mm -hmm. Just think about that, uh, you know, less than 10 million of humanity actually put serious time into <laughs> this, this, uh, this um, science. So in science, you need a critical mass of minds thinking about the same thing. 
to, to have a conversation, to, to have advance in science. And actually that really happened after the 1960s, where people really started to congregate that, okay, no, this is the next big thing, we should think about it. Yeah? So, so I think there is, there is more than, you know, what we see scientific development. We, we, need, we need human brains actually addressing and getting interested in this topic. And experiments. Uh, I mean, now we have, for, yeah. for cosmology, we have so many missions, so many experiments that it's, uh, it's spectacular. It goes to accuracy of the level that is of the same as particle physics, for example, which mm. is astonishing. If you told somebody 30 years ago, they would laugh at you when you, tr you say, I'm doing precision cosmology, they would yeah. completely laugh at you. Yeah. Yeah. They, they loved on me when I changed <laughs> from particle <laughs> physics to LIGO. <laughs> they said, you have perfectly good science. <laughs> Are you crazy? <laughs> so um, in terms of cosmology, there were, there were a couple of developments in the last, uh, the last generation, last 20, 30 years, that I'd like to discuss. And they ultimately bring us back around to um, the quantum general relativity disparity. Uh, but, but before we get to, to that, let's let's walk through those anomalies, um, dark matter. Uh, Maria, you've been working on that. You, can you introduce us to right, so where dark matter was, why it was invoked? Yeah, so dark matter, in fact, it's been uh, more than 70 years when Tricky uh, uh, at Caltech, he introduced dark matter um, in the clusters of the galaxies to explain um, explain the total energy conservation essentially in in the in the sky based on what you see from the light of the stars and the galaxies and what you can calculate. So he invoked something which is uh, called uh, the dunkel materi, the dark matter. Uh, it was a a phenomenon that had to do with gravity, and uh, there was no characterization of it. And uh, in the past uh, 40 years, we have seen that when we look at rotation curves in galaxies of stars, they, um, they seem to be, instead of following f the Newtonian law and going down, they used to... Uh, Yes, that also, but let me go first to the, <laughs> the curves. I will explain that, the bullet cluster as well. But we have the, the uh, instead of following Newton's law as we, you get out from the galaxy, it looks like they plateau as if there was extra gravity. As if there was extra gravity, which if it wasn't there, it wouldn't hold the stars together. So galaxies will f the stars in the galaxies would fly apart. So that's kind of important because it looks like excess gravity. Uh, we can measure it. But we don't know what is the source of this extra gravity. What is it exactly? When, uh, with the with the progress in all the astrophysical, astronomical observations, we are able to look at the sky in radio, in X, in all these different um, 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 wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we can see um, we can see the universe at the electromagnetic spectrum, and we can see the universe in terms of gravity, as we said, with the velocity curves. When we look at the at the at the, the picture that we have here. We look at the collision, the bullet cluster, at a collision uh, which takes 500,000 years, where the, the, the cluster collision leaves dark matter seems not to be touched at all, and uh, all the and it's the, the, the blue stuff, and all the red stuff is the is the gas where the particles are actually colliding. So what is the stuff that galaxies come together, they collide, but this stuff doesn't touch at all. And uh, completely different than the matter that we know, completely different than the interactions of matter that we know, non-electromagnetic at all. We call this dark matter, and we have developed uh, different kind of scenarios for what it could be. Could it be um, dark stars? Could it be uh, the, the, the black holes? Could it be, what could it be? We made a lot of observations, the astronomers and the cosmologists made a lot of observations, and they have excluded all sorts of um, large objects in the sky that could compose dark matter. And then there was this revelation that perhaps uh, we can explain dark matter as a, a new type of, uh, of particle, a new type of, um, if you will, something that it is not some, something that it is not included in the standard model, but it's an exotic particle. 
And what were the properties of this particle? This particle should be weakly interacting, so it's like a neutrino. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't interact with us. It, it interacts with us very, with normal matter, super weakly. In fact, in fact, super, super, super weakly, much weaker than the Higgs or anything else of the electroweak theory. Um, it's massive, so that it accounts for the evolution of the universe with all the cosmological parameters. What is the abundance from the beginning of the universe, and uh, and uh, we can produce it at colliders, or we can observe it in the sky when it annihilates with each other, or um, in fact, we can wait for it in detectors that are massive detectors and wait for a, a dark matter particle to go and interact with a, with a, in a nuclear interaction with the nucleus of, of, uh, of an atom. If we have a massive detector, let's say, with water or with, we can design many detectors, or in, a, or in a detector with silicon, and we can figure out from the recoil if actually this is a dark matter particle or something else. So in particle physics, we developed um, this idea that it could be a particle, and we had a very good theory for that, it's called supersymmetry, that was giving us such a candidate. And I'm speaking about was and, 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 uh, and in the past tense, because this, th th there have been about 20 years where we, were c we have been convinced that dark matter is a particle and we are going to find it. But you all read in the newspapers that supersymmetry, we haven't found any supersymmetry, any hints for supersymmetry. So now we are looking at the different detectors, the, uh, at the different detectors that we produce, uh, uh, we think we can produce dark matter. We look at it uh, in a form of, a, in a more exotic form, not just in the form of supersymmetry. And so do all the direct dark matter experiments that are, are awaiting there for a nuclear interaction to happen with the, with the dark matter particle. And the, the range of the masses that we are exploring are from the very low masses at the GeV level, at the mass of the proton, let's say, but it would be weakly interacting, all the way to 500 GeV at the, at the Large Hadron Collider. So if the particle, if the dark matter particle, whether it is supersymmetric or something else, is there, we have a very good chance to triangulate it among these three ways of experiments, the, the experiment, the indirect, the experiments in the sky, where dark matter annihilates with each other and produces different particles, excesses of particles that we can see, or in the collider experiments, where we actually produce dark matter, or in the direct dark matter underground experiments, a huge project, huge program of underground experiments, where we see the nuclear interactions with the active volume of a detector. So the status, the, there is a proliferation of dark matter experiments, and we have been saying in the past you know, 10 years, we have been saying that we are right around the corner to discover dark matter, and I think we are. If, the dark, if dark matter is a particle, we really are right around the corner because we have cornered it from so many experimental sources that it has got to be, it has got to be reachable in the very close foreseeable future uh, with all the experimental program that we have set it about. Well, I'm not, I'm not contradicting you, but I, I know from my research that beginning around 1980, people would say, we'll have the dark matter particle in five years. And then in 1985, it was five years, and uh, so on and so forth. Yes, that is correct. But it's do you like, think it's like cutting the, uh, the, you know, the deficit. Right. Like, I think that, um, it, it has and been the same, however, I will, I will remind you, it has been the same for the Higgs. It was right around the corner for five years every year, yeah. for a very long time, and you know, it took a little bit of a corner to go from the Tevatron to the LHC, and then we turned that corner. But that, think fi I think if it's a particle, it has to reveal itself in, the, in this and the yeah. next generation of experiments. We cannot, we are not going to be going to be shooting in the dark if, uh, if, uh, if we go beyond the next generation of experiments and dark matter is not there. I mean, there. it's not a search for something you don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. Correct. We know yeah. precisely, we don't know what it is, but whatever matter it is, we know how much uh, there is in the universe. <laughs> and you can see it there, by the way. You know, that blue, st you might wonder, wh why is that color blue? That's because you don't actually see, it. see directly that stuff. What you see are those bright sources, those white things. Those are <coughs> quasars behind the cluster, 
shining light through it. And then, as Einstein once explained in a beautiful paper, uh, he said, you know, mass matter is like a lens. Light passes around matter, gets deflected. So what you see there, and the way the observers measure the dark matter, even though they can't see it with li directly with light, they can measure the bending of light in the gravitational field produced by that matter. So that's why you, you can see it, you can measure it, and you can count how much there is. And it's, we say, 90% of the matter in the universe is, is in the form of this dark matter, quite precisely. Which is amazing. Most of the matter is uh, not made of the stuff that we're made out of. And we don't know what it is. It could be particles, probably as particles. But since we know how much there is, and and uh, we we have strong constraints on what mass it could have. Uh, yeah. So this is the, this is the plot, the pie chart there. So the twenty five percent of the energy the mass energy ma density of yeah. the whole energy density of the universe is a dark matter. If you take matter, that's ninety percent of the matter, and the ordinary matter, the little five percent of our magical stuff that we are made of, are the stuff that we can explain with particle physics. Uh, to 24 orders of magnitude, extremely precisely, um, the ph phenomena in, in energy. Um, so, so that uh, dark matter with which all the, the inference of dark matter is due to its gravitational interactions, but we cannot, we cannot really say, I, I, is it a particle, yes or no. We, we had the, the it, 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 there is something which is called the WIMP miracle. And uh, um, WIMP stands for weakly interactive, in weakly interacting massive particle. And uh, uh, people are today, they're talking about the SIMP miracle, which is the strongly interactive massing par massive particle, because we, the weak, with the in weakly interacting one, and this kind of a miracle that you would have 100 GV of weakly of WIMPs that would fit the, the, that would fit the model and would give you the dark matter that we uh, calculate uh, in, in the universe is just not having any, res we don't have any positive results as a particle. So while we think and we have good calculations and we think we have a good, we're not going in the, in the dark as, as David said, we have a theory and we have good calculations of how a particle like that would interact and we can calculate, we can do a lot of calculations and we have experiments while this is happening, we should keep an open mind and, and uh, uh, yes, it's a, the, the, the particle fits the bill but until you, uh, if you don't discover it, then it doesn't, mm -hmm. I, you, you cannot force it to be. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to keep an open eye, an open mind on that. Okay. And the other part of cosmology in the last generation or two that involves gravity but has left us with the mystery is dark energy. And Rachel, you've been researching that. So can you explain to us what, why we needed to invoke dark energy and what kind of research? Sure, yeah, maybe I can give a little bit of a history uh, which we touched on before. So uh, as recently as the 1920s, uh, as was stated, uh, it was widely believed, even by Einstein, uh, that the universe was, was static, that it hadn't evolved in time, that it looked more or less the same, it didn't have a beginning, it didn't have an end. Um, and in fact, uh, when Einstein tried to describe this static universe, um, of course, if, if gravity is the dominant force at action that acts at very large scales, what you would expect is a universe that will collapse over time because you only have this attractive force at large scales. So in order to write down a static universe, uh, Einstein had to, to introduce this extra factor, an extra parameter in these theories. It didn't have a good physical interpretation, but it was allowed by the theory and you could just stick in this extra factor in order to sort of uh, stabilize the universe or at least give you a static solution, although it wasn't, wasn't ultimately stable. Um, but it was at the end of the 1920s, uh, there was a series of observations, and in particular those of Edwin Hubble, um, who looked at distant, galaxy, distant galaxies and noted that they were moving away from us. Uh, and not only were they moving away from us, the ones that were farther from us were moving away at a, at a faster rate. Uh, and so if you believe that, that our place in the universe is not a special place in the universe, that we're not at the center of the universe and everything's just moving away from us, what this means is that the universe has to be expanding, that everything in the universe uh, is moving away from everything else. So, so this is somewhat revolutionary idea. 
Um, what it meant for Einstein's equations, though, and for Einstein's theory, uh, is he could get rid of this parameter that he had introduced by hand. Um, because you could imagine a universe that, that started out with some initial kick, that everything was expanding away from everything else. Uh, gravity's still the dominant force at large scales, so over time, even though everything's expanding, uh, it might slow down and start to contract again. Uh, so it was even more revolutionary then, uh, when in 1998, um, people observing distant supernova uh, noticed that not only was the universe expanding, uh, but it was expanding at accelerating rate. So stuff was moving away from us faster and faster. Um, and again, gravity should be the dominant force at large scales. Uh, there was nothing there to explain what would be pushing everything away from everything else uh, at a faster and faster rate. Uh, so there are possible interpretations uh, of, of what this could be. Uh, and I think the, the most common one is what's known as vacuum energy. Um, so this is an idea that, that comes from quantum field theory, uh, which is a theory of particle physics, uh, <coughs> which tells us that, that empty space uh, is not in fact empty. So this is going back to what we were discussing earlier. As soon as you invoke quantum mechanics, everything becomes dynamical, everything is fluctuating. So even if you have a vacuum with no particles in it, what quantum field theory is telling you is that you can produce pairs of particles that then disappear again. But there's an energy associated with this process. So there's an energy of empty space. Uh, and in fact, it turns out that, that this energy would have this effect of, of causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate this vacuum energy. All right, so that's fantastic. Um, so you can go ahead in quantum field theory uh, and you can calculate how big you expect this vacuum energy to be and you can compare it to what we observe. Uh, and the answer is off by 120 orders of magnitude. So that's a, a 10 with 120 zeros after it. So that's, that's quite a big difference. Um, so that is the mystery of dark energy. So what, what dark energy is, is sort of an umbrella term um, for whatever this thing is that's causing the universe to expand at an accelerating rate. It could be this vacuum energy. Uh, it could be a new force. It could be a new type of matter in the universe. Uh, we don't know what it is, but we call it dark energy, and it makes up 70% roughly of the, of the energy budget of the known universe. Um. Could I give a slightly different slant on... Please. So where Einstein formulated a principle of symmetry, all observers are equivalent, including accelerated observers. That's the basis of the general theory of relativity. And if you read his paper, he goes through, uh, not the one he wrote in 1915, the one he wrote in 1916, he goes through with that symmetry argument and says, these are the only equations I can write down. Now, I have no doubt he knew that he was lying <laughs> because there is a, so the equation, you know, a lot of the principles of physics are you take some, some quantity and you, the, solu the equations arise from demanding that this quantity be extremal, be minimal or maximal, be extremal. In other words, uh, small variations don't change it. So uh, just about all the laws of physics can be formulated that way as he did, and the term he extremized was the curvature of space-time. But there's another term, which he definitely knew about, called the volume. Space, you know, every, it has a curvature, a mean curvature, average curvature, and a total volume. And I have no doubt that he knew he could add such a term. Why didn't he include that? That's called the cosmological constant term. Why didn't he include that in his equations? Well, Einstein wanted to calculate everything. In writing down that equation, he had to introduce one parameter, that's Newton's constant, the strength of gravity, but that, in a sense, is, defines the scale of masses. If he were go was going to introduce this other term, the cosmological term, the volume term, it would involve another parameter, and he didn't like to have anything he couldn't calculate. He really believed that ultimately, the final theory, everything would be calculable. Then he started doing cosmology, and he wanted a static universe. And uh, he tried to solve the equations, and he couldn't get a static universe. So he said, ah, well, there's this other term which I didn't put in. <laughs> I can use that now, because I, I, it's more important for me to show my equations work for the universe as well as for a planet. So he puts it back in. He knows he's going to have to pay a price of having an uncalculable constant. He, by the way, never did dimensional analysis and said, no, I don't have to introduce an uncalculable constant. It's 120 orders of magnitude smaller than what I definitely know it must be the case. 
But anyway, and then when he when he learned that about the Hubble expansion and other theorists who constructed models of expansion, he said, "Well, at least I can get rid of this arbitrary constant." But you know, so there's another constant. What I, I think needs to be emphasized is, however, that the discovery of uh, cosmic acceleration and the measurement of that acceleration and the, within the cosmological standard model is, in my opinion, one of the greatest triumphs of general relativity ever. Because the volume term, from a geometrical point of view, or the vacuum energy, if you move that to the other side of the equation as the source of gravity that is observed, fits Einstein's theory to 10% accuracy, w equals minus 1. Mm. That's yeah. a fundamental prediction of general relativity. The biggest, success, in my opinion, lesson we learned from those supernova measurements of the expansion of the universe is that once again general relativity works. And if you interpret this term, you can either interpret it as the dynamics of the volume of the universe or a source that produces that dynamics, the dark energy, vacuum energy, any source consistent with general relativity will give this particular form of stuff that sources gra this part of gravity. But the stuff is weird. The stuff has energy and positive energy. That's always important to have positive energy. You get into trouble if you have negative energy. But it has negative pressure. So, you know, an ordinary gas pushes out. On the, you try to put it in a gas in a balloon, it pushes out. This stuff pulls in. It's like it had negative energy, but it doesn't. It has positive energy, but negative pressure. And it's that negative pressure that causes the expansion, the anti gravity aspects. But it has exactly, within 10%, the same negative pressure as positive energy. And that means that it looks the same to all observers. There's only one form of stuff with energy and pressure that looks the same to all observers. And that's this kind of stuff. So the fact that that expansion is of the particular form that's allowed by general relativity that Einstein introduced for the wrong reasons and then was glad to get rid of is, I think, a fantastic success of general relativity. Qualitatively. Qualitatively. It's not Quantitative, ordinary. It's the, it's the value that we have an issue with. It's the value, you know, the value yes, is a problem for theorists. We've got a lot of numbers <laughs> we can't calculate yet. We have a lot of numbers, very small numbers, that we have calculated already. But it's not an observation. You know, experimenters, I don't care, they measure it. Right, we need to explain it, and it's a bit hard to explain such a small number, but we've done so before in other cases by similar orders of magnitude. Right. So, 10 to the 120? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, the so the way I give the story usually is QCD, a theory I'm very fond of, a theory of the nuclear force, explains qualitatively, you know, in astrophysical terms, within a factor of 2 to 10, the ratio of the mass of the proton to the Planck mass, the basic, the scale where gravity, you know, mass big enough so that gravity becomes strong. That's 10 to the 19, a ratio of two scales of mass. If you convert the <laughs> cosmological constant into a scale of masses, and furthermore invoke broken supersymmetry, Three, which yes. helps a lot, you, you get reduce 60 orders of magnitude. Yeah, you get no, you get, <laughs> you get but you have to take the square root because you're now you're comparing mass squared. You know, right. cosmological constant doesn't have dimension of mass. Yeah. So if I, you know, I could say the QCD explains the mass squared of the proton over the Planck mass squared, which <coughs> is 40 orders of magnitude. So we've done it before. We have tricks to do it. You, the best trick is you take a large number, you, square you it. take its <laughs> logarithm. <laughs> And uh, that logarithm is a reasonable number you can imagine calculating. 
But whether you measure things with, you, whether you measure ratios, dimensionless numbers, or their logarithm, depends on the physics. It's a question of how does physics vary. We've learned from the standard model that physics varies logarithmically. That's our problem because it varies so slowly. That, that In other words, it's a big problem, but we will solve it. <laughs> it's it's an yeah, enormous money. theoretical enormous problem, theoretical. but it's not a mystery. At the qualitative first level, it's exactly what general relativity would predict. If you had to predict another term, not like the kind you're playing with, that's consistent with the principles of general relativity in addition to the curvature, obviously one's allowed. In fact, according the standard philosophy in physics nowadays and even Einstein knew that, is that if something is allowed by your general principles, it's there. You can't, anything that's allowed is mandatory and it has some value. And now the question is, why is it so small in some units? You can turn around and say, why is Newton's constant so small? Well, well. But, but the issue is how it receives quantum corrections, no? I mean, but so this, that's the issue of gravity generally. That's right, but, but that's why this is such a mystery, whereas, say, the electron mass is not. No, no, no. It's, <laughs> Newton, it's the cosmological constant in terms of the Planck mass, which is Newton's constant. That's right. So the number you're constructing is um, gn lambda, right? That is a small number. Whether I attribute it to g or lambda or whatever, that's the dimensionless constant. And as I said, uh, it clearly is a challenge for theorists. But unless it is not just the cosmological constant, which is predicted by the general principle of relativity and normal physics, and worked off the bat to 10%, maybe better now, 3% or so, I... Uh, Regard that as a challenge for theorists, but not a mystery. The well, fine the structure constant. The value is the mystery. The value so is, is the mystery. So is the fine structure constant. Well, but, so but that is isn't sensitive to UV corrections in the same way that the cosmological sure constant is. is. I mean, I know that if I introduce high energy it's physics, it's going sensitive. to have a huge change on what the CC is going to be. It's sensitive. So all everything in physics is sensitive to what happens at the Planck scale. But alpha is logarithmically sensitive. No, or this not if I include right, gravity. Okay, guys. <laughs> 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 we got, this is what's happening when you've got theorists <laughs> arguing all that. Like, I, I th in my opinion, as an experimentalist, they're both correct. But I, I want to say <laughs> that the challenge here is actually going back to gravity, is actually to your initial question. What is gravity? We said, what is dark matter? What is dark energy? What is black holes? And to all these questions, we pause. We, we, and th that's a big conundrum. Where we probably are on the right track. We're not like completely lost in, in, mm -hmm. in the sky. But, uh, but it's going to take a lot of work and thinking before we actually say, and now we've got it. And by the way, it's not so big. Yes, it is very big. And we're going to have to figure that out. Yeah, I think when, uh, from a layman's point of, point of view, I think that one of the exciting things about science uh, you know, there's a common perception that it's about coming up with answers, and it is, but it's also about coming up with great questions, mm -hmm. and that's what's happened here with dark matter and dark energy. Um, Javi, I was wondering if you could take us through some of the experimental side of gravity um, coming up. Now, you've, you, you've worked on LIGO, and you still are working on LIGO, and what um, that was initially the detection of the gravitational waves from colliding black holes, but there are other phenomena that could produce gravitational waves that we, at, at such a scale that we can measure? Yes, so uh, it is very important to, to approach, I think, gravity from the expanded viewpoint because whenever um, theory have questions, maybe experiments can even pose more questions or answer some of them um, or uncover information what we were not aware. So uh, in LIGO, we, we had to put on a plethora of sources, yeah? Anything, anything which does boom or does this will generate gravitational waves. I just generated some gravitational wave for you. Yeah, very small. You can't see it, but <laughs> it deformed you. I assure you, <laughs> uh, very little. And the shape of the room. <laughs> yes, yes, everything. Yeah. So, so we need we need very large masses. Yeah, and it was kind of a kind of a surprise that first we had seen um, fairly big black holes 
um, merging. But uh, that was very interesting because it was not just the discovery of a, of a black hole binary, but it was also a chance to test Einstein's gravity in a, in a really strong field regime, yeah? I mean, around these black holes. You know, gravity is, is fairly um, violent, yeah? So, so when they merged, there are kind of three phases, yeah? One is they go around each other, yeah? They get closer and closer to each other, and then they kind of merge, and then the, the final individual black hole, which was just born, uh, quiets down, rings down, and then there will be one black hole. And this means there are three signals, yeah? Three signals carrying information about the same, same phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And comparing those three signals, you can actually deriv derive a lot of information about Einstein's gravity. Uh, we were hoping to find something. We always want to find Einstein wrong. And, you know, the result is we always find him right. Yeah? <laughs> uh, what a tragedy. Yeah? So, so we, we, we did this study, and actually it was consistent with Einstein's theory. But, but looking at more black holes, maybe we will find a deviation. Maybe we will find uh, uh, effects we didn't count on. Yeah? And uh, there are other sources like, like uh, you know, a black hole, which was born, is roughly as big as Long Island. Yeah? It's a fairly big one. Yeah? So a smaller black hole, which is as big as Manhattan, um, or a neutron star, which is a very heavy star, 1.5 times heavier than our sun, roughly also the size of Manhattan, can be eaten by a black hole. Or two neutron stars can actually kind of merge and, and rip each other apart and form a black hole. Um, can happen. And all of these processes actually, actually um, test gravity on, on very different scales and ways. Yeah? So, so in a sense, the, the beauty in gravitational wave observation is that, that we, we just converted black holes from some mysterious, um, uh, beautiful object on the sky, our, our pacified laboratory. Yeah? From now on, black holes and neutron stars can be considered as, as our backyard laboratories where we can study the, the properties of gravity in a way we can never study it before. Yeah? So, so the discovery was, yes, a discovery. We were so happy to have it. Yeah, I worked like uh, uh, more than 16 years on this. I, I really wanted to discover something. It's, why did I leave if I don't discover something? But, uh, um, but, but, but we really kind of opened up new ways for everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. Theorists, other experimentalists, you know, there are people who are actually considering what happens when black holes eat dark matter, you know, kind of, kind of uh, putting black holes and dark matter together. Maybe, yeah? Um, so so there, are, there are actually new ways to have experiment evidence on, 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 on regimes of gravity which was not observed before. And, and hopefully they will give us a clue on, 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 on GR or, or the flaws of GR. Of course, you know, quantum gravity experts will tell us, yeah, gravitational waves need big masses and it will be very hard to observe, but not always. And we can say one thing about this experiment, which I, I think astonished me over the course of the years that I was following LIGO, that um, in order to get um, uh, the massive, uh, the effects of the collision of these massive, massive objects a billion and a half years ago to the lab, the lab invoked quantum engineering type of instrumentation. So gravity and quantum came together in the actual instrumentation of how you detect these m collisions of these hugely massive object objects that produce quantum effects on the mirrors of the, of the LIGO. I think this is spectacular in terms, of, in terms of technology. And as you said earlier, this we didn't have 20 years ago. When, when LIGO was conceived, there was, you know, they, they were talking about interferometry, but they were asking quantum optics people uh, in order to go ahead and develop this, this engineering. So I think this is a fit. And uh, they, they deserve really all the awards they're getting, all of them, although I think you got only $2,000 compared to the others. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I was born too late, so bad. <laughs> but I will make up. But there is also one, one more uh, important aspect. Um, you know, whenever whenever you, you consider these systems, they are really alien. Yeah? 
just imagine that two, two objects which are like 20 times, 30 times heavier than our sun going around each other, you know, your kitchen blender is, is, is slow. They go around each other with like like light. like sixty percent of the speed of light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's, it's like it's <laughs> like it's like amazing. During the lifetime, this object emitted three times the mass of our sun in gravitational wave energy. Wow, nature is having some problem with my microphone. <laughs> okay, so. You you know it's like uh, we had a science run yeah when you do the math uh, we discovered at least one gravitational wave because we published it yeah? yeah and and if you if you imagine that advanced LIGO will be three times more sensitive that means the volume three times three times three like like number twenty seven thirty mm -hmm. yeah so that's you know yeah. one a week. Yeah, one a day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be having discovery papers one after the other. Well, after but a while, it be, uh, will become more. Gravitational waves. <laughs> one. But but the Everybody sources. Want, you want yeah. to say something? Well, I want to. Uh, there's another aspect that black holes are great things, um, amazing, and it's w uh, fantastic to observe them directly. They're also uh, very weird. Uh, they're called black holes because, <coughs> classically, um, there's so much mass in a compact region that light can't escape. It's pulled back into the black hole. And since light is, travels faster than is the limiting velocity, means nothing can escape from that region of space. And that raises the kind of conceptual problem that General relativity, uh, in the hands of theorists, is full of uh, not experimentalists, unfortunately. So you'll, you're going to hopefully be able to see within a few times the horizon of the black hole, the, the region where light can no longer escape from. But according to classical relativity, there's no way of seeing into a black hole. So what, right. what, what, what's in there? And, and um, this has been an outstanding problem from the moment uh, that black people accepted that black holes actually properly exist. Because it raises very deep conceptual issues, such as the uh, conservation of information. So one of the, in quantum mechanics, in all of our successful theories in, and in traditional classical physics, you don't lose information. If you know everything about a system, or you prepare a system, you follow its evolution, you know, you can then do a measurement, and you know you know enough so that you can run the experiment backwards in time. You haven't lost information, um, in principle, if you're careful enough. But in a black hole, it, it seemed that you did because stuff went into the black hole, and nothing came out. So you're either left with this black hole, which, according to the equations, becomes singular. Everything becomes nonsensical. Curvatures become infinite, everything gets crushed, nobody knows what would happen. And then Hawking is famous because he discovered that in a quantum treatment, the black hole does emit particles. It actually emits thermal radiation. It, it looks like a hot object. Thermal radiation tells you nothing about what's going on inside an object except its temperature. Otherwise, it looks the same. So no matter what you put into the black hole, what comes out will look the same. Eventually, the black hole will evaporate. Nothing will be left. You've lost information. Violates uh, principles of quantum mechanics. And Hawking became famous because he said, general relativity, Einstein's theory, and quantum mechanics are mutually inconsistent. And it's interesting, the history of that, which happened also not in the 60s, in the 70s, 80s, the relativists, who were the general relativists, said, OK, we'll give up quantum mechanics. People like me, the particle physicists, said, no, we'll change general relativity. And that quarrel and study has been going on for the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. By and large, we won. <laughs> Correct? I mean, I think everyone agrees. <laughs> <What> if, <laughs> in the sense that 
<laughs> even, well, because we now know enough, understand enough, we think about that even Hawking admitted that black holes do not violate quantum mechanics. Information is not lost in formation of a black hole from which classically nothing can escape thermal radiation. Eventually, black hole disappears. Information is preserved. We have models of black holes which we can understand by ordinary quantum mechanical means. But how exactly this happens and what happens at these horizons, if you could probe close enough, uh, is still a subject of, you know, it's the theoretical laboratory in which a lot of the attempts to reconcile quantum mechanics and general relativity occur. They're fantastic laboratories. We're going to try to get to uh, one or two questions from the audience, but we did promise early on in the program that we would talk about some of the, 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 um, the wilder mm -hmm. prospects of how to resolve uh, quantum gravity. Does anybody want to go there? Well, I just want to say, so I, I think it's a little bit of an overstatement to say that quantum mechanics is incompatible with general relativity. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say that, um, in the, so we talked earlier about how we can describe general relativity as curvature of space-time, and this was the original way that Einstein conceived it. Um, but it turns out there's a, an entirely equivalent way um, of describing gravity, and that's as a force mediated by a certain kind of particle, and this is a particle known as a spin-2 particle. So we mentioned the other forces earlier, the electromagnetic force, the strong and weak force. So these are, are perfectly consistent quantum mechanical theories of forces that are mediated by particles. And you can describe gravity in the exact exact same language. You can describe it as a force mediated by this, this spin-2 particle. And when you do this, in fact, you can ask, what is the, the theory that I write down if I only want a force that's mediated by a spin-2 particle? And what you find is the unique answer to this question is general relativity. So you come back to the exact same equations uh, that Einstein wrote down originally without ever mentioning you know, curvature of space-time or equivalence principle or all these other things that we're used to. Um, and so there, there is a perfectly valid theory uh, at large distances or low energies of gravity as a particle, as a, th as a force mediated by this particle that's known as the graviton. And I would say that this is a perfectly healthy quantum mechanical theory. Um, we just don't know what it, what it continues to look like at the very, very short scales. But I, but I do think it's unfair to say that, that gravity is fundamentally inconsistent with quantum mechanics. No, I didn't say it. Hawking said it. <laughs> <laughs> I never believed it. No, he said it for a different reason. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it, it is I think it's, it's perfectly correct consistent. We, uh, but we, and you know, from the point of view of a low energy theory, there, there's never been a problem. The problem is with horizons, with, and, uh, and in, but in fact, I don't think there are many people nowadays who think there's any incompatibility of general relativity and quantum mechanics. Yep. The final story hasn't yet been given. That's I think we have to keep saying this. Would you yeah. Say because the, the usual thing is, is that, oh, you know, general relativity and quantum mechanics, no, no. But it's not That's like right. that. That's right, yeah. yeah. That's, great. That's important. Uh, so, should we take some questions? Waiting for the lights to go up so we can see. Yes, sir. Well, could you wait for the microphone? It's coming over. Thanks. Do all um, quantum mechanical processes take place in space time? That's our model. When you walk, you have a model that allows you to walk, which is space time. By the way, that model that infants construct of space time has been modified by special relativity and general relativity substantially so. But it's still only a model. You don't directly perceive space and time. You perceive events which we model as occurring in a, in a four-dimensional dynamical manifold called space-time. Some of us now believe strongly, and this is just a, you know, a, a guide, a clue, that, that it's probably at in certain regimes, when extrapolated to very short distances or to very strong fields or very high energy collisions where quantum gravity um, effects become important, that that's a poor model. It, it's, it's only an, 
a, um, an approximation to a better model of physical reality. It's in that sense that be, we n many people working in the uh, doing these speculations, trying to understand properties of black holes or other quantum gravity phenomena, say that perhaps we should regard space-time as, as emergent phenomena, as not being the ultimate way we describe physical reality, but just a sort of coarse-grained or a, a, um, a model of reality that's good for the kind of physics that were the scales where uh, it doesn't break down. There are strong indications of that from many sources of our current speculation, and there are even more and more precisely defined toy examples of how you can regard space-time, space especially, as an emergent phenomena, as an emergent object. Uh, gravity is an emergent object from other ways of looking at um, the same phenomena which don't, in, don't, don't have in their very formulation either space or gravity. So not only the quantum mechanical phenomena are happening in the X and T space-time, but in my, when we draw diagrams and we do calculations, we have, we have X for X, Y, Z, and we have T, and we calculate, but this X and T now is emerging and possibly from, from the quantum. So the quantum wins. Not geometry anymore, but the quantum wins. It's, I think it's spectacular thinking on, on how space-time emerges. And when we say space-time, we say gravity and so on and so forth. So it's a revolution in thinking on how these things will, will uh, evolve. Any other questions? Yes. I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on the idea of the Alcubierre warp drive? Say what's that? This is the, the <laughs> Star Trek thing. This is the uh, is oh, this? Oh, it's the idea like that. There's uh, through the Casimir effect, people are able to produce this um, negative or exotic matter, which acts opposite of regular matter, which instead of pushing like Anthrop down in space, space time is pushing like on two dimensional view of space time instead of pushing down, it pushes up. So like you could use a spacecraft to. Anti yeah, I heard about this, and somebody somebody told me recently that NASA is pursuing some some experiments on that. I don't know much about this. I mean. Uh, so I can't speak to that. My understanding of the Casimir effect or the basic laws of quantum field theory, that, that it's simply wrong. Yeah. There is no anti-gravity, period, whether you consider vacuum fluctuations or any other. One more question. Anybody? Yes? Uh, this one's for Rachel. Uh, you did such a fabulous job of explaining dark energy. Um, it, does it relate in any way to dark matter, or is that is it just that you don't know what either of them are? Yeah, I think the, the correct answer is we still don't know what either of them are. Um, they, so we gave them both the name dark. Um, there are theories that, that try and relate uh, the two of them, but I, I think that the current and most popular um, opinion is that dark matter is probably some particle and dark energy is probably just vacuum energy uh, and that the two things aren't necessarily related to each other. But how beautiful it would be if all the dark and the black things that relate to gravity can come of like sort of be explained in in this in a, in a way that is together. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you um, very much for your attention, and let's thank our panelists, please. Thank you.